Hey everybody, good afternoon. Are we on? Uh, thanks so much for Greg and the Holocaust team for having me. Uh, some of the time I'm a journalist at the crypto news site, The Block, which I highly recommend you all should check out. But for the last two years, I've really been diving deep into the open source AI ecosystem when it comes to image and video creation. And I want to talk about, a bit about my work today, but I also want to explain why it is that I think the open source ecosystem really unlocks the full creative potential of these tools in a way that the general front ends don't. So first I want to take you through the story of how I created this visual to start off with, a top down shot of a park uh, with the path spelling out open source. Now, I gave this a try on some of the closed source tools that are available. Uh, so in the top left we have Google's Imogen 4, which is their latest video model that was, or image model that was released last month. And here on the right we have OpenAI's images with their characteristic warm tint. Has anybody ever noticed that all the images are slowly turning yellow over time? I don't know what that's about. And I gave these images a prompt that was something similar to what you saw, a top-down view of a park with paths spelling out open source, adding in people walking around, benches, fountains. And they did an okay job, but to me, these don't really look like parks that you would actually find in the real world. The paths don't connect to each other, or even if they do, you don't see benches or fountains. The buildings can look a bit warped on the side. And the problem with these models in general is that you can give them a prompt. Sometimes you can give them an image to base off on. But really, they're just high quality slot machines. You hit a button, the image gets created, and that's kind of the end of the process. You can tweak the prompt slightly, get a slightly different image. But these tools are so powerful that if you learn how to unlock granular control over them, you can go so much further. So the image I used, or the model I used to create this image here is called High Dream. And I started off by giving it a simple prompt. Uh, well, <laughs> this is the program called Comfy UI, and this does look intimidating at first, but I want to take you through this process. So if you just give, uh, I'm forgetting the order of my slides. Uh, at a very basic level, the way these image and video generation models work is that they're trained on a series of images that noise is slowly added to. And over the course of training, they learn how to reverse that process, turning the randomized noise guided by a text prompt into a high quality image. And all of that happens through a number of steps through something called the UNet. Now when you use something like Imogen or OpenAI's image model, you're just going straight from the random noise to the final image. But the question is, can we tweak this process? And the answer is we can. So in this Comfy UI workflow, which I'll talk about soon, I started off with a prompt that was similar to the ones with the closed source models. And again, this is what it ended up with, but it wasn't that satisfying to me. It still doesn't look like a realistic park. But the question is, what if we start the image generation towards this, and then about halfway through the process, we tweak the parameters and we tweak the prompt to give it something more natural. So in this workflow, we start off over here with this first sampler that runs for about 40 out of 100 steps, about 40% of the generation. But then after that, we give it a different prompt, just telling it, given the stage we're at now, given the noise you have now, create a high quality photograph taken from straight overhead with an urban park. Uh, it's flat walking paths are interconnected and contain fountains, benches, and other common accommodations. And I'm using a couple tricks here to inject even more latent noise, giving it a bit more freedom, and using some samplers that do multiple calculations for each step to give it more accuracy. And so in the end, we go from something simple like this to what I think is a much more natural, realistic generation here. And then using a different model, which is called Sky Reels, we can take that image as a start frame and anim animate it into a video uh, with cars running around and some people walking around. And this was something that just took me a couple hours of tweaking. Um, and what's incredible is that these high powered models are good enough these days to run on consumer hardware or, as I do often, they can run from the comfort of your MacBook Pro on an Akash chip. And this process, tweaking the denoising process throughout the generation process can be used in a lot of different ways. Like for example, this image on the top left, if you give it a style prompt like Van Gogh's Starry Night, you might be able to tell. You can tweak the, tweak the parameters in different ways to get an oil painting look, a much more painterly look, trying to preserve the details. And to me, this is a much more interesting artistic process than just modifying a test, 
text prompt and, and pulling that slot machine lever and over and over. This is just one of so many ways that you can control the image generation process using open source tools and techniques that's more complex and more involved than uh, the closed source models. And by tweaking the parameters, you're in complete control. So um, this is another really cool uh, application is regional prompting where you can draw masks on the original image and have a different prompt. Like on the bottom left and top right, you can have a dark gothic castle. And on the top left and top right, you can have a more animated, colorful scene. And the image model will apply these different regional conditionings into a final result. There's also something called control nets, which is a popular technique where you give it some information. You can give it a depth map. You can give it an outline. And it'll create an image that corresponds to those um, those inputs. It's just another way you can control this video generation process. It's a bit more strict, but again, using some of those techniques, you can open it up to more freedom. And um, IP adapter is another way that's common to uh, give an image as a prompt or a style prompt, sometimes combining it with a control net to get a final image. So the question is, how do we use all of these tools together? And the answer is in Comfy or Comfy UI, which is my program of choice. It's one of many, but in my opinion, and, and the opinion of the developers, it's the most powerful open source node-based application for generative AI. And Comfy UI as a service is pretty simple. It's a blank canvas where you can add any nodes you want. And at this point, there are thousands, even I think tens of thousands of custom nodes from different developers. And look, the workflows can get crazy and they can get really crazy, but the point about point of Comfy UI is you can bring together all sorts of different models, all sorts of different techniques, all into the same workflow. And it really unlocks the creative capability of these models. So these are just some of, some of the reasons you would want to use Comfy UI. It can integrate with tools you already know, like Blender. Cutting edge research development from the academic world make their way to Comfy UI first. People figure out ways to get video models to run twice as fast and more efficiently. Uh, it's free to run on your own hardware or on cloud hardware provided by Akash. You can work with images and videos. There's no censorship. It's really community-led and open source. Um, nowadays, there are APIs that you can use to access closed models like Kling and VO3, um, Pika, to take the output from a closed source model, but then be able to work with it more in Comfy UI. Even techniques that used to be, take tons of times for animators like rotoscoping or background removal. The latest AI models can do it so much more efficiently than highlighting every single frame in After Effects with the lasso tool. If you've ever done that, you know how much of a pain it is. A lot of these tools have made that pretty much obsolete. Um, and training and using LoRa's is really important. So a LoRa is a mini model that you can train on your specific artistic style or your specific character. And that really unlocks character consistency, which is something that's missing from a lot of the open source models, or the closed source models, rather. If you want the same character in different environments, you're not going to be able to achieve that through just prompting. If you prompt a brunette woman with large eyes, she's going to look different between the different generations. And there's truly so much you can do with Comfy UI. Here's another example of a project I did uh, using a video model. So what I wanted to do was transform this dragon climbing onto Daenerys Targaryen's shoulder into something different. So the first thing I did was use a model from Meta called SAM2, which stands for Segment Anything. And all you need to do, you can see on the left there, is take the first frame of your video and you draw green circles around what you want to mask around. So green circles on that dragon and red circles around everything else, just simple points. And then just from that first frame, the model propagates through and draws a mask around the dragon throughout the animation. So what do you do once you have a mask like this? You can use a model like Vase, which is built on an open source video model called Wan, which comes out of China, which right now is the most powerful foundation video model we have. And Vase is a model trained on top of Wan that allows you to do a lot of cool things. But one thing you can do is in-paint into a video with a reference. So I took that, that input video here, and I gave it a picture of a cat and a prompt just saying, a cat crawling on her shoulder. And now we have this video, where just in one pass, it's replaced the dragon with a cat in a completely seamless, completely realistic way. Again, just with a little bit of effort. And this is something that uh, is possible through something like Pika, but the quality I've found is much lower, and the customizability and the controllability is much lower. 
I've used these techniques in Comfy UI in a variety of different ways. Here's an example that you might have seen online. It got some pickup, but replacing a character in a scene. Uh, this is, goes far beyond simple face swaps because you can see it's consistent even when he turns around. And his hairstyle and his head shape is different. But the background stays consistent. His suit's a different color, but the movement is natural. And this is something that's possible through video models because you're processing lots of frames at once so it can keep the context. Uh, here are a couple other examples. You can do stylization, like turning a live action video into animated video. You can turn a dog into a ball of yarn. And all of this was through Comfy UI. Now, the main thing I would say about Comfy UI is that a lot of these closed source models, they have a low skill floor, meaning you can just hop onto the site, write a text prompt, get a decent result. But they also have a low skill ceiling. You can only get so good at writing prompts and getting the result you want to get. Comfy UI, it has a high skill floor. It's a bit complicated to learn how to use to learn how to use, but the skill ceiling is so much higher. Once you can use all these tools together, it really unlocks the full creative capability of these models. Uh, here's another video of a friend of mine made using a, a Laura that someone trained of people cutting objects into cake. And once you teach an AI model what cutting someone into cake looks like, you can apply that to existing videos. Uh, here's another severance-themed uh, face swap I did with Kendrick Lamar. So these were just a few of my fun, you know, meme-centric projects, but the capabilities really are endless. So if you want to learn more about this stuff, I recommend uh, the Stable Diffusion and Comfy UI subreddits, which are all focused on open source image and video creation. There's a Discord server called Banadoko that I found to be a really informative community full of uh, custom node developers, AI artists, and people who are model trainers, uh, ML experts, people who are really interested in making this open source ecosystem thrive. And um, I'll be around the rest of the day. Just come up and ask me about any of this stuff. I will talk your ear off about it. But um, that's what I've got for you. Thanks to the Akash team for having me. And have a great rest of the conference.